3. We must use our eyes. In addition to the legal problem, on a more fundamental level, we have the moral problem that passes through the heart of each one of us, in that hidden interior room where our freedom decides for good or evil. I have said that when the decision is taken in favor of abortion, there is necessarily a moment at which one agrees to shut one's eyes to the right to life of the little one who has just been conceived. The moral drama, the decision for good or evil, begins with our eyes when we choose whether or not to look at the face of the other. Why is infanticide almost unanimously rejected today, whereas we have become virtually inured to abortion? Perhaps the only reason is that in the case of abortion, one does not see the face of the one condemned never to see the light of day. Many psychologists have pointed out that in women who intend to have an abortion, the spontaneous pictures formed in the imagination of a pregnant woman are suppressed. These imaginative speculations, what name will a child have, what will it look like, what will its future be, often return later as unresolved feelings of guilt to torment the conscience. The face of the other addresses an appeal to my liberty, asking me to welcome him and take care of him, asking me to affirm his value per se, not merely to the extent to which he may happen to coincide with my own interests. The moral truth, in this case the truth of the unique and unrepeatable value of this person made in the image of God, is a truth that makes demands of my liberty. When I decide to look him in the face, I am deciding on conversion. I am resolving to let the other address his appeal to me, to go beyond the confines of my own self, and to make space for him. This is why even the evidential character of this moral value depends, to a large extent, on a secret decision by my liberty to agree to look at the other and thus be provoked to change my life. In his preface to the well-known book by the French biologist Jacques Testard, L'œuf Transparent, the philosopher Michael Serres, who seems not to be a believer, takes up the question of the respect due to the human embryo and asks, who is man? He points out that philosophy and culture do not supply unambiguous and genuinely satisfactory answers. But he notes that although we do not have a precise theoretical definition of man, we know perfectly well in our experience of everyday life who man is. We know this above all when we are confronted by someone who is suffering, by someone who is a victim of power, by someone who is defenseless and condemned to death. Ecce homo. Yes, this non-believer quotes the words of Pontius Pilate, who possessed the plenitude of power, in the presence of Jesus, who had been stripped, scourged, and crowned with thorns, and was now condemned to die on the cross. Who is man? It is precisely the one who is most weak and defenseless, the one who has neither power nor a voice to defend himself, the one whom we may pass by in the course of life, pretending not to see him, the one against whom we may close our heart, saying that he never existed. We are at once reminded of another page in the Gospels which offered a reply to a similar request for a definition. And who is my neighbor? We know that if we are to recognize who our neighbor is, we must agree to become his neighbor, and that means stopping, getting down from our horse, drawing near to the one who is in need, and taking care of him. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I should like to draw attention to a passage by a great Italian-German thinker, Romano Guardini. Man is not inviolable merely in virtue of the fact that he exists. An animal, too, could lay claim to such a right, since it, too, exists. Man's life remains inviolable because he is a person. To be a person is not a psychological but an existential fact. It does not depend fundamentally on one's age or psychological condition or on the gifts of nature with which the subject is provided. The personality may remain below the threshold of consciousness, 
for example, when we are sleeping, but it remains nevertheless and must be taken into account. The personality may as yet be undeveloped, for example, when we are children, but it has a claim to moral respect from the very beginning. It is even possible that the personality in general may not emerge in one's acts, since the psychophysical presuppositions are lacking, as in those who are mentally ill. Finally, the personality can also remain hidden, as in the embryo, but it exists in the embryo from the outset and has its own rights. It is this personality that gives men their dignity. It distinguishes them from material objects and makes them subjects. We treat a thing like a thing when we possess it, use it, and finally destroy it, or, if we are speaking of human beings, kill it. The prohibition against taking human life expresses, in the most acute form, the prohibition of treating a man as if he were a thing. This makes it clear that the look I freely direct to the other is decisive for my own dignity too. I can acquiesce in reducing the other to a thing that I use and destroy, but by the same token I must accept the consequences of the way I use my eyes here. These consequences fall back on my own head. You will yourselves be measured by the measure with which you measure. The way I look at the other is decisive for my own humanity. I can treat him quite simply like a thing, forgetting my dignity and his, forgetting that both he and I are made in the image and likeness of God. The other is the custodian of my own dignity. This is why morality, which begins with this look directed to the other, is the custodian of the truth and the dignity of man. Man needs morality in order to be himself and not lose his dignity in the world of things. There is one last decisive step that we must take in our reflections, a step that brings us back to the passage in Genesis where we began. How is it possible for a man to use his eyes in such a way that he perceives and respects the dignity of the other person and guarantees his own dignity? The drama of our times consists precisely in our incapacity to look at ourselves like this, and that is why we find it threatening to look at the other and must protect ourselves against this. In reality, morality is always embedded in a wider religious context in which it breathes and finds its proper environment. Outside this environment, morality cannot breathe. It weakens and then dies. The ethical recognition of the sacred character of life and the commitment to ensure the respect for life requires a context and a perspective, and these are supplied by faith in creation. A child can open himself confidently to love if he knows he is loved, and he can develop and grow if he knows that he is followed everywhere by his parents' look of love. Similarly, we too succeed in looking at others in a manner that respects their personal dignity if we experience how God looks at us in love. It is this look that reveals to us how precious is our person. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Christianity is this remembrance of the look of love that the Lord directs to man this look that preserves the fullness of his truth and the ultimate guarantee of his dignity. The mystery of Christmas reminds us that in the Christ who is born, every human life from the very beginning is definitively blessed and welcomed by the look of God's mercy. Christians know this and stand with their own life under this look of love. With this look, they receive a message that is essential for man's life and for his future. This means that they can humbly and proudly accept today the task of proclaiming the good news of the faith, without which human existence cannot long survive. In this task of announcing the dignity of man and the duties of respecting life that flow from this dignity, they know that they will probably meet with derision and hatred, but the world cannot live without them. I should like to conclude with the stupendous words of the ancient letter to Diognetus, which describes the absolutely essential mission of Christians in the world. 
For Christians are not distinct from other men in terms either of their territories, their language, or their way of life. They live in the cities of the Greeks or the barbarians, as the lot has fallen to each one, and they adapt to the customs of the place in their clothing and food and in the rest of their way of living, offering the example of their marvelous form of social life, which all admit has something incredible about it. They live each in his own native land, but as if they were foreigners. They take their share in all the burdens as citizens, and they put up with everything as strangers. Every foreign land is a native land for them, and every native land is a foreign land. They get married like everyone else and have children, but they do not expose their newborn children. They share their table, but not their bed. They live in the flesh, but not according to the flesh. They dwell on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the laws that have been laid down, but with their manner of life they rise above the laws. They love all and are persecuted by all. To put it in a word, Christians are in the world what the soul is in the body. The soul loves the flesh that hates it, and loves its limbs. Christians, too, love those who hate them. The soul is shut up within the body, but it is the soul that sustains the body. Christians, too, are held in the world as in a prison, but it is they who sustain the world. God has assigned them such a high position, and they are not allowed to abandon it.